And the voice came from heaven and said, This is my beloved son, with whom I am well, well delighted. Listen to him. My dear people, the words that we just heard are words that come as a testimony, as an epiphany of the Father towards Jesus. A manifestation who Jesus was. And that was reserved to the early church. Do not tell nobody about this vision till the Son of Man rise from the dead. And Peter, in the awe of Mount Tabor, he said to him, and I hope all of you are saying right now, Lord, how good it is to be here. Let us build three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But he was not known what he is saying. In that awesome vision, at the time Jesus came and touched them, he said to them, do not be afraid. You know, to understand that transfiguration, which I have so much to tell you about it because there is so much meaning in it. Maybe I touch it very slow, very, um, in a short, short uh, period of time. But I'd like to go to the first reading today. We encounter a man from Mesopotamia named Abraham. God said to him, up in age, 75 years old, he had a wife, Sarah, she did not conceive children, and he said to him, get up, leave Ur, and go to Canaan. The question in Abraham responded was, why? What security am I going to have there? All these questions came to his mind. But the scripture said to us, Abraham just obeyed. And that is the secret. You don't question God. You just do what God said to you. Fiat, secundum verbum tuum. Let it be done to me according to your word. If you want God to really make miracles in your life, you just let him be at the steering. If you want to steer your car, you will find yourself in a place you don't want to be. But if you let him steer your car, you will find your place where he wants you to be and you want to be. And that's why in that gospel today, we see Jesus talking to his disciples. We are going to Jerusalem. They are going to put me in the hand of sinners. They are going to make sports of me. They are going to nail me to a cross. I am going to die. And I am going to rise. And we see that the apostles, although they have heard this many times, they were very sad. And so, he took them on the tower and to give them a manifestation of his glory, he transfigured it in front of them. Many people say, we are in land preparing us for the death of Christ and here we are in the head because this land is going to lead us to Easter. And there is no suffering without glory and there is no glory without suffering. One is always attached to the other. Now for the time being I am going to ask you to make a little bit of Lecture Divina. Close your eyes. Imagine you are on the mountain top of with Jesus. There is Jesus who is transfigured in white. And on each side there is Moses, represent the law, and there is Elijah, represent the prophecy. Remember that Moses has to go on a mountain so God will talk to him. And so does Elijah have to go on Mount Carmel from where he was taken. And on this transfiguration, they are discussing with Jesus the events that are going to take place. And Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. I did not come to destroy the law, but to bring it to fulfillment. And here he is fulfilling the prophecies, whatever happened within a moment. 
And the early church is there under the mountain. Peter, James, and John. The church is full of joy at the transfiguration of the Lord. And she wants to remain there. But Jesus is telling the church, you cannot stay there. You need to go to Calvary. And that is the road of each one. Can you open your eyes now? And now you have a glimpse of what took place. That is how you study the scriptures. The Vina Lectures. How you really bring into focus, put yourself into the action that takes place. And you have a great knowledge of what taking place. Your imagination works very good. That transfiguration was given to them so they can have a lift because they were very, as we say, depressed that the Lord was about to take him from them to the cross. And now we come to the second reading and to see the theme of the two readings, which are really parallel to each other, is going to have a great lesson in the letter of Paul to Timothy. Remember St. Paul, before he was taken into prison, Cesare Filippi, he appointed people to be presbyters. And some of them he appointed them to be bishops. And one of called his co-workers, Timothy, he sent him to Ephesus to be a bishop there. Now Ephesus is our Rome today. Remember that there the church really developed among the Greek fathers and there they come, even councils met together to discuss as, who is Mary, especially in 431. And we know that this, this young priest, becoming a bishop, finds it very hard to go among priests who are older than him. You know how it feels. You are sent to be the manager of an office, and there are people there who are 20 and 30 years working there. Yeah, they will tell you, I will tell you what to tell me what to do. You know how it is. Because we always have the, that, that uh, I have been here before you, and you're not going to tell me what to do. So this is the element that Timothy is finding. Not that he was rejected by the priest, but how it is. And we know that the people that Paul has formed as a church, they begin to astray from the truth. And now St. Timothy is really getting depressed over this. And St. Paul heard about it. And so he wrote him the second letter and told him, Bear with me what entails to the gospel. He said, your suffering, your discouragement is not just yours. I went through it. I was rejected by from town. I was being, I was beaten. I was left hungry. I, I saw shipwrecks. I saw pain because they put me to a pole and they beat me more than once. So what you are going through, I know what people can do to you. Especially if you bring the value of the gospel. <laughs> the value of the gospel is contradictory to the lifestyle of this world. And if you don't want to live by Christ, you are not going to make it unless you make it through the cross. Take up my cross upon your shoulders and follow in my footsteps. And that's why St. Paul is saying to his co-partner, bear with me what it tells in the gospel proclamation. Be holy. So that is the call of each one of us. Not only to those who are called to the bishops and priests, but also to those who are baptized. Be holy. That is the call we have. The holiness is the call of the universal church, especially nowadays to the Vatican Council. And then he said to him, remember that we have been given a privilege to understand the mystery that God has for us. That mystery that does not belong to your piety, but belongs to Christ. Because through his death and resurrection, we are saved. 
And so I ask you, and I challenge you, to continue to be fervent against those who come to you, who challenge you about your faith. Because your faith is based in Jesus and Him alone. My dear people, those words of St. Paul to Timothy <coughs> apply to us in our time that we are in, the time of Lent. And during this season, we are, yes, to discipline ourselves. Some people say, well, I don't eat candy, well, I don't eat this, or I don't do this, or I don't do that. Those are good things. But then Lent comes and goes and will remain the same. So what does Lent really mean? I want change of heart and not of clothes. Not because you sell sackcloth or you put ashes on your head, like did the Old Testament used to do as a sign of penance, but render your heart. Open your heart to the grace of God, because this is the time of salvation. And how are we going to do it? I examine yourself. Examine yourself where you are in relation with the Lord. You, a married woman, see how you are really become a means of salvation for your husband. You, a married man, you're supposed to sanctify your wife. You are called to this great mystery of marriage to really make each one holy because you are there to be the guide to guide others to eternal life. You as a wife, is there something in your life that really disturbs your husband? You husband, is there something in your life that by your actions, words, or deeds are really being not very, as we say, a good husband to your wife? And you say, how I know that? You go in that shop. You don't take too much. You are passing by. You are going shopping. You are going doing some errands. You are doing anything you want in town. You just park the car here, go from the door, and just say to him, Lord, what do you want me to do? Give me some guidance. I am lost. And you silence yourself. Stop talking. And I guarantee that the Lord will give you guidance. Because he said, ask and you shall receive. Knock and will be open for you. So do it. <coughs> me as a priest, the Lord is telling me that there is things in my life I need to change. Not because I preach to you, I need to save my soul too. And that's why maybe the Lord is telling me there are things in your life that you are not doing right. And I want you to do this, and do this, and do this, and stop this, and go here with this. And how I receive the guidance? To the Lord. There is the secret of our lives. Come to me, all who labor, and find life burdensome, and I will refresh you. But then, when you hear the direction of the Lord, then you need to do it. Because the Father has said, this is my Son, in whom I am well pleased. Listen to Him. So now don't go for direction and don't listen, like I go to the doctor and I do the opposite of what she tell me. Lose weight, yeah, I lose weight, all right. I eat all the candy that I found on the table last night. <laughs> Take this medicine, oh yeah. The medicine, all right. I forgot it in the morning, I didn't take it in the evening, and I said, it's all right, don't be. Exercise! Yeah, they gave me a bicycle for Christmas. It was there and remained there for how many months? September, January, February. <laughs> and that is, you know, sometimes the direction we receive. Because we are stubborn people. <laughs> and that's what the Lord is trying to say to you and to me. If He is giving you direction, then do it! And one thing that the Lord is trying to say to you is, transform your life. And that transformation comes in that room. You know that room there? They have doors. You know what they call? You know what they call? John, you know what they call? 
Have you been there lately? <laughs> That's what it's called. A confession where you are going to really become naked, not of clothes, because otherwise I call 911. But the only thing is, of yourself in front of God. You'll be open like a book, because he knows you what you think you know. And humble yourself. My dear people, I never said this, but I will say it. I learned to be humble from that confession. There are so many good people who have a clean conscience, a very delicate conscience, a conscience that they want to make amendments and begin anew with the Lord. And they tell you, Father, I know that this is wrong and I want to start again. Father, I know that what I am doing is not what God wants me to do. And that's why I'm here today to begin and your life with God. That is a transformation. What it is that we celebrate Lent and then at Easter you all come with the hats and with the tie and ready to go to here like going to a, a big, big day. And then your soul is not ready to resurrect it with Jesus. Because you still are in your sins. <coughs> Jesus came from heaven not to say, how are you, Peter? but to say these words, peace I give to you. <coughs> As the Father sent me, I send you. Receive the Holy Spirit. <coughs> the sins that you forgive will be forgiven. And the sins that you hold bound, they will be hold bound. So dear people, don't think because you go to the cross or you go to God by an act, you are going to forgive from your sin. I have to say to you, you are going to ask for a big surprise when you are going to be rejected from heaven. Because heaven is a place where the Holy goes. If your life is what we call it to a faccia, you know what a faccia means? To face. You know, we have plenty of them to face it. They pretend that they are this and they are this. If your face is double life, you cannot serve me and serve the devil. Either with me or against me. You cannot be with me and scatter at the same time. <coughs> Make a point, dear people. I am very grateful that God has blessed us this past week, and for those who missed the mission, they missed the best uh, spiritual exercise that we ever have uh, in your life. Father Geoffrey was a very good man. You can see the hand of God in him. He spoke to us, and he challenged us. And he asked us to continue this challenge. Many of you went to confession and you are very happy about that because you feel free. And that's what Jesus came. He came to release us from our enslavement of sin. And sin keep us down in a bandage. And that's why I challenge you. This coming month we are going to have another penance service. We do these things purposely to incite you to come. There will be different priests. Many of you do not want to go to me. I don't blame you. <laughs> but I have a one philosophy. Be like a lion from the pulpit. Be the gentle lamb in the confession. Because there you have to exercise three roles. You are the pastor. That means you are the teacher. You are the doctor, the spiritual doctor, and you are the voice of the church. That is the three exercises you have to have. And if the souls who come to you, you need to lead her. When somebody comes and says, Well, Father, I went to other priests and they told me, you know what I say, I stopped the, con I said, Stop the confession. Go to the other priest and leave me alone. You come here because you know that that other priest who told you so, you are not satisfied. 
And because you are not satisfied, you come to hear the truth. Now if you want to hear the truth, open your ears or leave the confession. We cannot play games. Either you come to be cured or you come to justify yourself. We cannot do that. Sin is sin, whether you like it or not, is against the law of God. And whoever, whoever committed is really an agent of the one who is evil. My dear people, I really ask you, if you really want happiness in your heart, and you have happiness in your home, clean yourself from sin. Many of the problems we have in society, behind them there is the big S-I-N. When that is cleansed, even your sickness, your physical sickness will go. Because some people are sick spiritually, and they will never be whole unless God comes in and takes over. You can pray to St. Teresa how much you want. You can tell me how much candles you burn. You can tell me to put your name on the list for the sick. Unfortunately, you will never become whole before you say to yourself, Lord, I am sorry. I have sinned. And that is what the responsory psalm was all about. Have mercy on us, O Lord, for we have sinned. That is the first sign of a recovery of alcoholic. How many of you, I don't remember because it's a good question. Many of you attend meetings of the alcoholics. Did you not? I did. Not because I am one of them, but I want to see what they do. And the first thing that they do is, they come forward in front of all of them and they say, My name is Carmen, I am alcoholic. And there is the beginning of the healing, when you admit who you are. A few moments ago, remember, at the confidium, and the church is going to change it so that you really make it your own. You say, I confess. So if you confess publicly, it means you are, no? Huh? So if you are a sinner publicly, why don't go privately and do it the way Jesus wants you to do? It? Is there any problem in that? No. You say, Father, I don't want to come and talk to you. I understand. But remember that it's an option. Scream and sit face to face. I, pre I prefer, not for you, I prefer face to face because I want to tell the priest, listen, I don't want to hide behind my finger. I did this. I said this. I made this. And I want to see his reaction at his face and also how he is going to bring me back. My dear people, do not let this sentence be in God before you approach the sacrament of confession. Because that is what the Feast of Easter is all about. It's the Feast of the Sacrament of Penance. That's why Jesus has to die and to rise before he established this sacrament. In fact, it was given to us on Easter Sunday night. May God bless you. May God continue with you. And the joy that we have this past week, which I am really cloud nine with it, because I really felt God's presence in our parish. And that is the joy of a priest, believe me remain with you, and may you spread that joy in the lives of others to come to know the Lord. And they already see some results of that mission. I see some people sitting next to some people that they were not here some Sundays ago. And don't think I don't know those. <laughs> <laughs> may God bless you. Keep up the good work. God love you. Bye -bye. <coughs>